What's up, Otakuans? Welcome back to another episode of The Manga Corner. As promised, this week we will be moving on to Rising of the Shield Hero in hopes of catching up to what we will be seeing from Season 3 this October. We have a long road ahead of us, but I'm sure we will make it by the end of the next season. As mentioned last episode, the new style of these reviews will mostly focus on new information from the novel that wasn't quite included in anime. This allows us to get a better feel for the story, while also not bogging us down with information we can simply watch from the season itself. I hope this way proves easier to follow, but without further ado, let's jump right into The Rising of the Shield Hero, Volume 1. Chapter 1, A Royal Summons The first chapter of the novel focuses on our main character Naofumi's life before Esekai. He was a sophomore in college living his best otaku life with regular trips to the bookstore and plenty of time to play all his favorite video games. He wasn't rich by no means. He did have a part-time job, but that was only to supplement the money he was also receiving from his parents to go to school. Whenever he was low on the funds, he would instead opt to hit the library instead of buying a new book. As for video games, we learned that his usual playstyle whenever he played his online games was to simply farm for rare items and to build up his resources. Then, after selling his wares, he would continuously generate money. He was never the attacking type. Starting from episode of the anime, on one trip to the library, our protagonist happens across a book that fell off the shelves. He begins to engulf himself into the story of heroes, kingdoms, and waves of destruction, and while reading, he suddenly loses consciousness. Chapter 2, The Heroes We continue right from where we left off in the anime following the title screen where Aunt Naofumi is esekai into this new world surrounded by men in robes. The novel follows these scenes nearly one for one as the heroes began to demand negotiations as soon as they're transferred. Though we do receive a bit more dialogue from the internal thoughts Nafumi had about the other heroes, he did find them to be jerks and they weren't as appreciative as he was and excited about their current circumstances. We then go into the main hall with the king where they learn about what's going on with this world with the ways of this, with destruction. Unlike in the anime, we hear about the story of the world first and then the heroes introduce themselves. Now Fumi starts to think the book he was reading right before he was transported had a lot of similarities to the current circumstances. Outside of this, the rest of the scenes of this encounter remain the same. The chapter closes out when the heroes are take their leave and go to their rooms. Chapter 3, A Heroic Discussion a heroic discussion continues to follow the anime where the heroes gather together in the evening and talk amongst themselves. It begins the same where Naofumi is starting to come to the conclusion that this world is a lot like a video game. The other heroes are like, no duh, but when they speak about the game it relates to, they all are confused and through questions of current events, they come to the conclusion that they are all from different Japans. The conversation takes a turn from the anime. Before Matoyasu has to break down the sad truth about the shield hero, they first go into conversation about how each of them died. Rin, the sword hero's story, was he got caught up in a murder case and managed to save his friend and catch the murderer, but apparently during the struggle he was stabbed in his side and died. Now Fumi instantly wrote him off as someone who boasts about things that never happened. Motoyasu, the spear hero, was supposedly a very popular with women and he ended up killed by too many girlfriends. This of course takes Naofumi off. Isuki, the bow hero, was classically done in by truck home. When Naofumi discloses he simply passed out while at the library, the group stares at him coldly and then we move to Motoyasu explaining to Naofumi how bleak his adventure may be. The chapter closes out with the group going to dinner and discussing taking a bath. They are all tired, but excited about the next day. Chapter 4, Specially Arranged Funding Chapter 4 begins post-breakfast with the heroes waiting on the king's summon. We then continue with the anime where the heroes receive their travel companions, but no one chooses to ally with Naofumi and he's rightfully outraged. After some protesting, an adventurer named Mine joins his party and after the events at the castle, the two head to an equipment shop. On arrival, just the sight of the shop excites Naofumi for how much it met all of his expectations. After a brief exchange, our hero finds himself trusting the shopkeeper more and more. While they discuss different weapons, we learn about blood cleaning coating that helps keep weapons after long, prolonged, prolonged use fighting monsters. 
We then find out that the shield hero is not allowed to use another weapon due to his shield's restrictions. Instead, he purchases armor and equipment instead. They then depart the shop and head off to fight some monsters. Chapter 5, The Reality of the Shield We begin right before where we start in the anime. Mine leads our hero to a field just outside the castle walls to where she knows weak monsters are. She tells Naofumi that she won't be training with him since she wants to get a sense for where he is currently. He then goes to try his hand at fighting the orange balloon monsters. He has a rather tough time as we see in the anime, but unlike the anime, after the hero defeats the monster, he notes when the drop gets close to his shield, it glows and gives a description. He then tells Mine it's her turn and she easily takes out two balloons that suddenly attack. From this, Naofumi truly understands how weak he is. With this knowledge, he comes up with their battle plan and they soon set off back to the equipment shop. Chapter 6, A Backstabber Named Landmine We continue just like in the anime to the equipment shop where he goes to get armor from Mine and has a funny haggling with the shopkeeper. He notes that whenever he played online games, he would try to buy things cheap at auctions and then resell them for profit. Haggling came easily for him. Right after, the hero and the shopkeeper agree on the price for the equipment Mine chooses and they head for an end. Mine immediately asks for two rooms and doesn't move on the subject. We then rejoin the anime from dinner where Mine and Naofumi discuss the day's events and possible future hits. The conversation follows the anime quite closely even to Mine offering Naofumi to drink with her. Naofumi turns her down, not because he can't, but because he doesn't get drunk easily. They finish eating and Naofumi turns in and plans out his funds for the future. He vaguely remembers someone yelling and someone pulling at his clothes while he sleeps, saying how much men are fools. When he finally awakes, he finds that he overslept a bit and he was only wearing his underwear. He realizes he's been robbed and all of his money and equipment have been stolen. He's then apprehended by the kingdom's knights and we continue on to the castle. Chapter 7, False Charges The next chapter continues where we left off where Naofumi is drugged in front of the king and the charges of attempted grape is brought to him. Again, everything is pretty much a one for one, but we do get to hear more of his internal thoughts on the situation. He wholeheartedly blames Motoyatsu and believes he has schemed all of this since day one. All the hopes and dreams he had about this new adventure were shattering around him. He was truly being sent spiraling into despair. The heroes then find out there is no way to send them back to where they come from, and since he's a hero for the upcoming waves, they also won't punish him. When Naofumi breaks free of the knights versus the anime, one of them takes a swing at him and he instantly regrets it when his hand is broken on impact. Naofumi then storms out of the castle as his current situation finally starts to sink in. Chapter 8, A Ruined Reputation A week has passed since everything had went down and since then, our hero has been training just outside the castle walls. Naofumi had been walking around in his underwear when the shopkeeper spots him and calls him over. One thing to note is when the shopkeeper grabs him, Naofumi immediately sees mine when looking at him. Though he is angry, he doesn't threaten the shopkeeper and instead just walks away when he does get released. The shopkeeper then gives him a bag of clothes and a cape, knowing how difficult it would be only in his underwear. Shooter Hero then goes to train and gather more balloon loot. After a day, he manages to level up and gather good enough loot to sell and maybe get something to eat. We then see the same scene from the anime where he must haggle to sell the loot. They come to an Amako agreement and he pays back the shopkeeper and pays for some food. This is the first instance that he knows that the food he eats tastes like nothing. Afterward, he sleeps out in the field since he has no money left and since he can't be hurt due to his defense being so high. When he awoke the next morning, he was covered in balloons, but still not hurt. While thinking of ways to make more money, he remembered grasses in the fields that looked like the same medicinal herbs that he saw back at the apothecary in town. He goes to gather the different plants and absorb them into a shell. He even met some of the leaf conditions when he absorbs them, and he goes on to look at the other types of shields that he has accumulated so far. He goes into his help menus and reads a lot about changing his shield as well as unlocking the other types of shields that he, he's also gained. He also sees that he has other abilities and equip bonuses that he has with each of those shields. 
He then equips his newly acquired leaf shield and notes the gathering skill one he had when it was equipped. He now knows he can build even more residual income as he tests the effect of the skill. Not only does it allow him to gather plants by simply raising his hand towards it, it also gives a small bonus due to the skills that he has. After spending some time gathering, his leaf shield equip bonus unlocked, allowing him to use the effects even when the shield isn't currently equipped. He makes his way back to town to resume with the anime with the apothecary shopkeeper and our hero selling what he had gathered. He made 50 bronze pieces from the sale, so he then went to the restaurant to eat even though the food still tasted like nothing. People asked to join his party, but they all looked unsavory, so he refused and soon he grew tired of their constant intrusions while he ate. One man tells the hero he will join his party, and we kind of see what we saw in the anime, but only with one guy. Again, he looks like mine to him, and once it became clear the guy was just trying to use him, Nafumi takes a balloon monster and places it on the man's face. Since they were still in the middle of the tavern, people began to yell. Now they realize that their monster, there's a monster in the middle of the bar. So he just paid for his food and left. He continued the same pattern for a few days afterwards. Chapter 9 They Called It a Slave Two weeks have now passed since Naofumi found his new way of making money and putting it into play, unlike where in the anime the conflict lead right to where he met the slaver. He had finally saved up to 40 pieces of silver coin, the same amount he threw back at Montayasu that unfaithful day. During this time, our hero has tried his best to raise his level on his own by defeating monsters, but alas, there is no real hope. The problem wasn't he was getting hurt, but simply he wasn't effectively hurting the monsters. Once, he visited the forest and found the red balloon. After more than 30 minutes of clashing, he eventually just gave up and left the forest in an even more foul mood. Unable to do any real damage, he was forced to grind his levels in the beginner fields, since he could at least beat those monsters. And then two weeks later, he finally reached level 4. Just then, he noticed a red balloon chewing on his arm. Thinking since he had raised his level since he first encountered it, he tried his luck. Nothing. With too low of an attack, he can't hunt monsters. If he can't hunt monsters, he can't gain XP. And if he can't gain XP, he can't raise his attack. He was in a never-ending battle. While mulling this over in the back alleys of town, we finally meet the slave owner as we did in the anime. The interaction pretty much went the same all the way outside the conversation turning to slaves well before Naofumi entered the tent. Another difference would be the anime seemed to make it seem like Nafumi showed interest in the raccoon girl first and made the decision to choose her, while in the novel, Nafumi and the trader went through plenty of slaves ranging from battle slaves to sex slaves. The trader was interested to hear that the rumor was false, and we soon moved into talks about what would best work for Nafumi. The trader then shows him three cages, one with a rabbit man with a deformed arm, the raccoon girl who suffered from panic attacks and was clearly sick, and a deranged looking mixed breed lizard man. Now Fumi made the decision on the little girl because he thought of mine and how indifferent he would feel if he were to lose her. We then close out the chapter in the same fashion as the anime where Raftalia, the slave, joins his party and she receives a slave mark that will force her obedience. In the anime, all of this happens in the end of the long first episode and the beginning of the second. Chapter 10, Kids Menu. Our next chapter continues along with the anime where Naofumi and Raftalia visit the usual equipment shop and Naofumi gets both clothes and gear for Raftalia. Though the shopkeeper was a lot more vocal about his feelings about the situation, the conversation and scenes went pretty much the same. Once Naofumi finds a small sword for Raftalia, he forces her to pop the balloon monster he has stashed underneath his cape. When she initially refuses, She's reminded about the curse she has when she obey, disobeys and then she decides to follow those orders. Both Nafumi and the girl gain a little XP from this. Next, he pulls out a stronger balloon and tells her to try again. This time, she doesn't hesitate. She immediately pops the balloon and they gain even more. We then continue on to the restaurant scene where Nafumi buys Raftali her first real meal in a long time. This exchange remained quite faithful to the novel with how people reacted to him and the slave being there, and how surprised Raftalia was that she was being fed. Other than not for me thinking on how much he hated this world due to the silent whispers and the uneasy glances he felt. Chapter 11 
the fruits of slavery. Right afterwards, the two finish eating and they head out to train. Now Fumi notices she still seems afraid, so he assures her that he wouldn't let her get hurt, showing the balloons hidden under his cloak. This seems to settle her a bit more, so once they reach the fields, we see that they run into three red balloons that they easily dispatch. Raftalia levels up to level 2 because of this, and now Fumi unlocks a new shield. Here we see he explains who he is and who, how he came to be, and this actually has a positive effect on her. We then continue to find more monsters to feed, including the mushrooms we see. Something more important to note is, though he continually defeats monsters and gains new shields and abilities, none of them were stat boost nor offensive. He did unlock compounding, which led him to create the slightly poor quality healing medicine and fair quality basic medicine he provides to Raftalia for her cough. Something I do want to touch on now so we don't have to keep mentioning it, while the anime does show some scenes of the new shields he acquires and levels up, the novel is a lot more descriptive when it comes to the shield's effects and abilities he begins to accumulate. There are often times where Nafumi will spend his free time going through his shield menu to learn more or randomly add plant stones monsters to his shield in hopes to unlock new abilities and shields. While this is mostly a trial and error, oftentimes this does yield success and we learn of a new shield and abilities that he acquired. Now Fumi spends the rest of the evening doing just this and unlocking new shields through his compounding and feeding those to the shield. Another major part the anime left out is when Raftalia has the night terrors, it will always cause his monsters in the area to attract and now Fumi spends a lot of his time defending off these creatures. By morning our hero had very little sleep and was forced to hold the screaming child close to him to soothe her dreams. He asked her to keep watch while he slept, and we again gain insight that Nalfumi doesn't necessarily care about her backstory and what's her issue. His only concern is getting back home. Chapter 12, What's Yours is Mine. Again, the anime seems to wave top a lot of these smaller scenes, if not leave them out entirely. After the gates open, Nalfumi and Raftalia head back into town, but not before Nalfumi makes some more medicine for her cough. They then visit the apothecary where he is quite impressed with Nafumi's skills, especially with no sort of experience. He learns he could possibly make money if he sold the medicine he provides instead of the herbs. He also receives a proper item such as mortars and pestles and flasks that he can use for the compounding. Here's where we see the scene from episode 2 of the anime where a kid playing with a bouncing ball catches the eye of Raftalia and Nafumi decides to purchase her ball. From the anime, it gives the impression that Naofumi went to purchase one for her, but in the novel, since the ball is made of the balloon skin, while selling his wares, he asks if the shopkeeper can throw in the ball and sub subtract it from the total. Though regardless he did pay for it, he didn't go out of his way to please the girl. The way he figured it, the happier she was, the more money he would make off her. They then head back to Shrain where they run to newer monsters like the Egg Up, which resembles an egg and cracks like one when defeated. They hunted for a while and found different variations of this monster, but the only abilities that offered were crafting and cooking abilities. Finally, they called it a wrap for the day and another long day of training. Nafumi had reached level 8 and Raftalia level 7. Nafumi figures her increased growth rate is simply due to her being the one to land a killing blow. They head to town and eat and after a brief meal of potato skewers, Nafumi decides to rent a room like an anime, but that is because he wanted to have a peaceful night and did not want to deal with the attacking monsters again. This scene plays out the same, but what the anime does leave out is after they get the room, Nafumi allows Raftalia to go out to play with her ball, where she is harassed by a group of kids due to her being a demi-human. Nafumi sees this and goes outside to teach the kids a lesson with his surprise balloons. Though she's still trembling with fear, she thanks the young hero and they head back to the room. Chapter 13, Medicine. The next scenes are quickly shown in the anime where the two go to have dinner at a restaurant and Nafumi gives Raftalia a haircut. Nafumi at this time does drop a few strands of her hair into his shield, but it gave him a message that his level wasn't high enough. He then begins to work on his daily compounding creating both nutritional and medicinal potions. He also allows his shield to absorb these potions, again unlocking new shields, but even these abilities only allowed him to boost his stamina, SP and half stamina decay down effects. 
All of this was very confusing, so he promised himself to research and find out more of what these things meant. He then turns in for the night, again having to hold Raftalia close to him to keep her from screaming. And when he awakes, he awakes to a crying little girl in the cold, wet bed. Raftalia was afraid and was expecting to receive a stern punishment, but was assured that it would be wrong of him to get mad at a repentant person. With her learned experiences up to this point, she's rightfully confused. As for a punishment, Nafumi forces her to drink more of the medicine he had compounded for her. Chapter 14, To Take a Life Our ch next chapter begins where we continue in the anime where the two face off against a wild Usopo. In the anime, the scene is condensed to one engagement with the creature, while in the novel, the first Usapo Raftalia only killed after being told if she doesn't, she'll be replaced, and then the next after explaining what he needs to do for the upcoming waves of destruction and how he will fight for her, their survival. Knowing this, she again finds her courage and kills the creature. She then looks for reassurance from Nafumi that he won't replace her, and his mind wanders. He clearly uses this threat to get her to do what he wants, and he thinks of that woman again and thinks it wouldn't be so terrible if she died. He then assures her that as long as she did her job, he would never abandon her. They finish up their training for the day and they turn in with cooking and compounding. Today he is pleasantly surprised to find that as long as she's near him as she sleeps, she won't cry out in the middle of the night. He also realizes she's been eating a lot more lately. Chapter 15 Demi-Humans We begin where we left off with our two young heroes farming experience and loot from hunting Usupos until Raftalia weapon breaks. This bit was left out, but Nafumi then hands her his utility knife and they can get back to the equipment shop. On the way there, they sold all of their wear and made 70 pieces of silver coin. At the equipment shop, Nafumi requests new gear and a new weapon for 65 silver coins, whereas the shop owner apologizes for giving them such a cheap one from the beginning. At this time, the shop owner also comments on how healthy the two of them are looking lately. From here, the haggling begins and we meet up to the scene we see in the anime where the shopkeeper offers her a short sword instead. While in the anime, the two immediately move on. The novel continues with the owner offering both sword training lessons for Rotalvia and also gives Nalfumi a wet stone so he can actually take care of the weapon. The shield immediately reacts so he allows it to absorb the stone and his shield then unlocks the sharpening skill, which gave him both auto weapon sharpening and aura appraisal. The sudden changes in the shield alarm the shopkeeper and Nalfumi re-explains his shield's abilities. Finally, Nafumi asks about the dungeon on the other side of the village, in which we continue with the anime. Chapter 16, The Two-Headed Black Dog Continuing from where the two reached the village, just before the dungeon, Nafumi is thinking of making this town his new base of operations. In the anime, the town is called Loot, while in the novel, it's called Ryu. We then continue from where Nafumi is selling more loot to an outside vendor while getting info on the mines. In addition, Nafumi learns about the different types of ore found there and their value, and Nafumi is already dreaming of all the money they can make. We then move to where they found the old cabin in the anime. Outside of the rope that unlocked the airstrike shield in the anime, they also found a map of the mines and a pickaxe that Nafumi absorbs into his shield. This is actually important because it unlocks a mining skill that Nafumi utilizes to locate efficient places in the ground and walls to mine. As they explored and mined, they found large footprints that suggested a dog shortly before they found it. From here, the anime follows closely to the whole engagement except for Ralph Talia's backstory. Here we find out their town was attacked by monsters and even though they had warriors to defend, they were simply outnumbered. Her parents actually led the evacuation to help protect people as they tried to escape. Ratalia's final moments with her parents were them being cornered on a cliff and her parents choosing to sacrifice themselves and push her into the river below. By the time she washed up and returns to the village, the monsters were defeated by the knights and adventurers, and most of the village was already gone. Even then, before she became a slave, she continuously fought to restore the village until slave hunters captured, tortured, and brought what we have today. Again, the engagement remains the same, but after the battle is over, instead of Rautalia using his name for the first time, she realized she doesn't even know his name. After absorbing the monster's remains, the shield receives a new form, the two-headed black dog, which is something we do see him use later on. 
after gathering their wares and applying healing medicine for his wounds, he realizes this is the first time he's been hurt since coming to this new world. As for more cut content, after the battle, Nafumi and Raptaya continue mining for ore. Nafumi utilizes the new mining skill to discover some hidden light metal in the wall, and he absorbs it into a shield, unlocking the light metal shield. This ends up actually being the highest defense rating of all his shields so far, and he knows he'll most likely use this during the next wave. After this, they finally return. They sell the extra ore that wasn't absorbed and manage to rake in a great price. Chapter 17, Preparing for the Wave. It's been about a week since the last events and the team were busy getting stronger. We see that Nafumi has not stopped unlocking new shields from the monsters he's absorbing. From the shields he's unlocked, he's unlocked abilities such as wood cutting, simple weapons restoration, paralysis resistance, and the skill shield prison that we see him use in the anime. Episode 3 in the anime starts off from where Raftalia goes chasing after the porcupine like monster. Raftalia has reached level 25 and Malfumi level 20, and she has grown quite quickly lately. We find out that the alert skill he had unlocked a bit ago would let him know when monsters were within 20 meters, but since it didn't also include a direction, it wasn't actually that useful. Since the porcupine was able to get close, it did get a hit on him, and due to him having his weakest shield out at the time, he got hurt. Raftalia uses the opportunity to remind the hero he needs to have better equipment. He writes it off as a fluke and the battle continues. After the battle, we have some more cut content where Nafumi talks about how much they have learned so far about properly breaking down the monsters that they kill so that they can get the most bang for their buck. He then excitedly absorbs one of the needles from the porcupine in hopes of finally getting an attack centric effect, to which he's rewarded with attack one, needle shields, small. Though it's only one point, he, has more, he is more happy about finding a shield tree that has attack stats. After going through his stats, Raftaya asked about the buffs and was more curious of what type of defense rating it gave versus how much attack it gave. She makes mention she needs a new sword and asks to get one for her reward and he agrees. She sharpens her sword and using his sharpening skill and plans to go to equipment shop and use the 230 silver coins to get her something grand. We then see the same scene that plays out instead in the shop happen while they're still in the fields. She goes him from getting hurt and points out the fact that he looks like he's nothing more than a mere villager. She pushes him to finally agree to designate the bulk of his funds to new equipment and the rest to her own weapon. She is satisfied and he's left wondering where is this cheeky Raftalia coming from, though she may be the best for him. Chapter 10, Barbarian Armor. We finally reach our neighborhood equipment shop where just as in the anime, the shopkeeper shows Raftalia a bit of attention and Nafumi immediately grows to know it. In his eyes, Raftalia is that same 10 year old he had met, though he admits she has been eating a lot more lately. Not only that, her coughing has seemed to go gone away almost entirely. From here, the dialogue mostly remains the same outside the two arguing about equipment for her versus him since they had already agreed. He first shows Nafumi to some chain mail to which he instantly becomes sad, remembering the incident. We also learn of something called Airwig that allows equipment to absorb the user's magic to make himself lighter. Another change we see in the novel, the Keeper gives the two a list of items to get, so Raftalia is excited at the idea that Nafume will finally look like a real hero. They go get the necessary materials, but while getting those materials, here is where we see Nafume grow irritated to how everyone now treats Raftalia. To the point he even considers giving them all lectures about being lolicons. Here's where he returns to the shop and tells the shopkeeper about his shopkeep friends all being lolicons like an anime and Raftalia quickly stops the conversation. He then pays for the new equipment and is promised by the next day and they move on to Raftalia's weapon. They trade in the two swords they currently have, and since Nafumi has been good at upkeeping them using his shield, with the leftover coin and the trade-in, she gets a new magic iron sword with free blood cleansing. Afterwards is a scene we see where they go to a restaurant with their leftover coin, and Raf shows even more rebellion. Chapter 19, The Dragon Hourglass. We continue along with the anime where Nafumi returns to get his armor. After Nafumi tries it on, he fully appreciates the professionalism of the shopkeeper's work. Though he thinks it makes him look more like a villain, Raftalia thinks it makes him look cool. Nafumi checked on the stats and he could see it was slightly better defensively than the chainmail he originally had. 
He also had the feeling the Keeper put in even more added effects. We continue with the anime where the two head to the Dragon Hourglass after only just now hearing about it from the Keeper. Though the novel pretty much follows the events of the Hourglass, it does take the time to note just how much Matayasu has changed in the month it's been since we last seen him. The armor he wore was made of silver, not iron, and his clothing was made of crimson, likely imbued with great effects. Underneath, he wore chainmail, probably the same, and his spear no longer was flimsy, but now vicious and powerful with a sharp tip. As the room became more and more crowded, all Naofumi could do was look for escape routes. While Matayasu flirts with Raftalia, Naofumi even believes she may leave him and join him instead. As we go forward, we see he's still dealing with his serious trust and abandonment issues. Though the animation has shown a scene where Matayasu warns Raftalia about Naofumi, this doesn't happen in the no novel. The two just storm out. Afterwards, Naofumi hit the fields and blew off a little smoke with some weak orange balloons. Chapter 20, The Sword. The sword starts out as that next scene in the anime does, with everyone in the kingdom preparing in the last hours before the, the wave begins. Raftalia initiates the same conversation that we see in the anime, with the addition to Nafumi really thinking about what all she had been through before she came to him, and how much he truly needed her to not die, so that he can continue to use her. Something the anime doesn't really make clear is Nafumi's absolute disinterest in anything Raftalia was saying to him. He only tolerates it because he saw it as part of his job as her owner. Though, afterwards, he did realize he may came off as a little bit rude, but he couldn't muster any more. In the last moment, the two prepared to be transferred, then boom, they were instantly somewhere new. He notices the heroes running to the crowds of monsters in the distance, but next, he notices the town of Ryu nearby. While the monsters are spawning nearby, he made the decision to instead go help the village. Chapter 21, The Wave of Destruction. The wave is here and the anime did not disappoint, following Naofumi's valiant defense of the village. Only things of mention is the fact that the show is picky choosy when they want to include all of his shield changes and effects that he's acquired. Honestly, I think it's one of the best parts of the story and it gives credit to his intelligence to juggle so many different shields and effects and still utilize them to their best capabilities in the heat of battle. Using a vast majority of what he's gained in the past months, he successfully holds off the orb, protects the villagers, and lower the collateral damage overall. Now, F Fumi and Raptaya's teamwork were also put on full display and the villagers rightfully grew to respect him. He was portrayed to be a bit nicer in the anime to the villagers, helping, but honestly, he was more of a dick to them and blamed the kingdom for everything. The two young heroes and the knights who eventually came to the village after immediate disagreements worked together to protect the village for hours until the cracks in the sky where the monsters were pouring from finally closed. When the knights invited them to the castle, the two joined the rest of the heroes back to the castle and en route is when the villagers confronted Naofumi with their thanks. Though he'd rather be treated this way versus like a criminal, he still trusted none of them due to how wishy-washy they seem. The chapter continues on the episode 4 of the anime, where they're all at the feast and they're talking about all the lo lost people from the waves. Supposedly the numbers remained in the single digit, so this wave was not as bad as the last. While he overlooks the party, he instead thinks about the waves to come. He wonders if the other heroes know about the option to designate the knights to come along with them, and of course curse them and the kingdom for being such fools. Something we do miss out on is Raph asking Nafumi if he likes fat girls after he allows her to go crazy on all the food at the feast. He even thinks about if he has some plastic containers if he can bring some of the food back with him when suddenly he sees Matayasu barging towards him. The challenge and the order from the king were next to follow. Chapter 22 The Clash of Spirit and Shield As Nafumi headed to this makeshift arena in the castle's garden, he looked around at the other heroes, nobility and knights that surrounded him. He knew everyone there knew how ridiculous this fight was and he knew they all came there to see him lose. His anger and hate for Matoyasu bubbled over and he directed it at defeating him. Again, the anime does this battle some justice but it does leave out Nafumi tackling Matoyasu attempting to beat him with his fist. No effect. That's when he places a balloon directly onto his face, two more on his legs to keep him from standing and one last one on his crotch just for good measure. He then puts all his weight onto the one on his crotch. It's probably understandable why the anime decided to leave this one out. From here, we see the two-headed dog shield that he acquired from before. 
Also, like in the anime, he utilizes the airstrike shield and shield prism, but most of this involves keeping Maltiyasu on the ground after his initial tackle. At this point, Nafumi felt like he could actually win. He continued lobbing balloons and hold him down when he was suddenly attacked from behind. While the anime showed mine clearly attacking him, no one but the shield hero supposedly saw her. He noted her use of wind magic, wind blow. The rest from there was an easy wipe for Matsuyasu. Chapter 23, All I Wanted to Hear. The chapter starts as the anime continues from Matsuyasu being announced the winner. Again, the events play out the same where no one listens to Naofumi about the cheating. Naofumi finds out mine is the daughter of the king and Naofumi finally puts it all together. It all was a trap set up by the king and the princess all to see him fail, but why? He imagined that the spirit hero would likely marry the princess and their legacy would be built on his defeat. He also remembers the book he read right before being transported here and remembering the bitch of a princess from the story. This is where he continued to Nafumi unlocking the curse sh series of the shield. We continue to Raftaya telling Mine and the spirit hero off, letting them know she knows of the accused crimes and the spirit tries to use this to persuade her. She pushes past them and goes to Nafumi exactly as an anime. Just the same, she convinces him that she's truly there for him and says the exact words he needed to hear and he finally sees her for the girl he, she is. She explains the whole phenomenon about demi-humans growing with their levels versus their age. She explains that though she was still a bit immature, she was no longer a child. Though she's finally breaking through, she closes the deal by promising that if he still doesn't believe in her, she happily retake on the slave curse. At this, Nafumi loses his composure and sobs in her arms, and then soon drifts to sleep right there. Chapter 24, Epilogue After it all, they found a servant's room to rest while the feast was going on. Here he decided on the new names for the King, Trash, Mine, Bitch, and the Montayasu, Clown. Seeing he wasn't eating, Raph brings him something that looks like a sandwich. Just like the scene from the bridge, he finally can taste the food that he eats. He explains to her that since he was framed, he hasn't been able to taste anything. He knew all of this was because Raph chose to trust and believe in him. He no longer wanted just to survive. He wanted to move forward and try not just for his own sake, but hers too. He leaned in and gave her a kiss on the cheek. This of course flustered Raph Tyre, but unfortunately, showed Hero took it for anger and decided to never do this again. This isn't some anime, right? Then we continue on with the saddest friend zone in history. All right, that is the close of this story. I can honestly say that Shield Hero is my favorite light novel I've been reading to review so far. There is so much that the anime leaves out that I think is just useful information. But what do you think about the hero's journey so far? Something that must be pointed out is the fact that season one of the anime, only the first four episodes covers volume one. So like I said before, we have a long road ahead of us, but I'm sure we'll make it because is simply worth it. Well, see you next time, guys. Peace.